subtext of what you're describing here about Paz's potentials and risk uh, suggests that it's perhaps uh, the more, in an underrated way, the more democratic party of, of the PR, one can say, because DAP is still dynastic, mm -hmm. right? And uh, P P R P K R it was potentially dynastic. I, uh, P K R right. is almost a family business. Almost a family yeah. business, right? But PAS has had that intern enough internal dissension, has survived internal enough internal dissension to have a democratic culture of its own. Mm. Yes, and not only that, you note, uh, I mean, uh, the prominent leaders of PAS, uh, Dr. Burhanuddin, Dr. Zulkifli Mahm, yeah, the key that these two men were together. Uh, they are descendants, even though. We know that they are there, you know, that some are members of the party, have never aspired for higher office in Mas itself. Even Mujahid Rawa, son of, of Yusuf Rawa, is, is quite humble and realistic in his own political ambitions within the party and cognizant of the fact that he doesn't want to, to give the impression of there being a dynasty within Mas. I think this is commendable. I think this is commendable. And also remember that you know, PAS has a history of deposing its own presidents as well. This is how mm -hmm. Asri Muda you know, uh, was, was kicked up. I mean, it was an internal party coup and he was removed by his own party. So that dissension is there. The, the one point where I think uh, PAS's democratic uh, credentials are compromised in a rather serious way is uh, of course the election of the Moshirullah. Mm -hmm. Because the election of the Moshirul Am is not a party matter, it, it, it is left to certain key <coughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, organs of the party, namely the, the, the Executive Council, the, the, the Dewan Shura, the, De the Dewan Ulama and the Dewan Pumuda. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I think the uh, Wanita Pass, uh, Muslim Pass, do not vote for mm -hmm. the uh, I was gonna, I was gonna ask you uh, about that question about its uh, track record of enabling uh, women leaders. Can you comment something about that? Well, again, you know, I think, I think uh, perhaps uh, one of the unsung heroes or unsung heroines of past uh, has been uh, Doctor Lolo, the late mm -hmm. Doctor Lolo, who, who um, for me, uh, you, you know, stands. Uh, heads and shoulders above so many politicians in Malaysia, male and female, uh, Barisan and Pakatan, simply because what, what I found most admirable about the to, Dr. Dr. Lolo was, was the fact that you know, in, in the policies and, and, and the programs that she initiated, we, we find an absence of emotionalism. Which is, which is astounding because you know Malaysian politics is borderline Bollywood. Uh, <laughs> everyone wants to be you know a, a drama actor. Um, everyone thinks that you know he's playing a Leonardo DiCaprio part. You know everyone wants the headlines. Everyone wants to be photographed in front of Batu caves. You know uh, both sides. You know, but Dr. Lolo, Lo, you know, push for policies, uh, um, care for single mothers, for example, with no judgment no emotionalism, no rhetoric, nothing sensational. It was, it was the closest we got to a completely rational, you know, uh, 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 logical, emotionless politics, which I think is something that is overdue in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm tired of watching political dramas in yeah. Parliament. If you want to watch drama, I'll go and watch a Sinetron. Yeah, uh, I, I really want to see core rational politics. So in that respect, Dr. Lolo was an, was an asset. Speaking of emotions, um, past youths has, you know, past youths, uh, have repeatedly um, brought itself to attention for, for the most, you know, for the most uh, ridiculous of issues, the Hantu Bonching, Elton John's concert, anything else like You know, to what extent is this foreshadowing uh, the kind of, because they're youths, to what extent is this foreshadowing past his future, and to what extent can we read that as a sentiment that might carry over, mm -hmm. should it be in power? Well, I think if we look at, again, um, all the parties in Malaysia, yeah, in both coalitions, all, you know, uh, past youth, PKR youth, uh, DAP youth, and on the other side, you know, AMNO youth, MCA youth, MIC youth, Karakan youth, uh, they, 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 there seems to have developed in Malaysia a certain convention, although there's no necessary reason for this convention to be there, but somehow the idea is that if you qualify as youth, that is a license to be as irrational as you want in public, mm -hmm. you know, and to be as dramatic and, and to do things which surprisingly yeah, stops immediately the moment you leave youth. And we've seen this, we've yeah, seen this yeah. in past, we've seen this in Amno. People who, you know, one year 
uh, going around, you know, waving banners and flags and threatening this, threatening that. The next year they leave youth and they behave like adults. You know, this is astounding. This is immediate transformation overnight. Which then reminds us again of the theatricality of politics in many developing countries, which is the thing I absolutely cannot stand. Mm -hmm. Because if you want to, to, to go play acting, go and join the theatre, don't join a political party. And, and, and I think I'm, this is what Malaysian, younger Malaysian voters in particular, should be demanding. I think it's an insult to say that youth have to behave like this. Mm -hmm. you know, youth, why do youth have to be the loudest, the most demanding? and the ones who demand the most irrational and you know things in the most uncompromising way i think youth you know precisely because i see youth as being wiser because they're born later mm -hmm. yeah, um, should bring vigor energy but also you know intellectual energy and intellectual energy is not drama they're two these are two very different things so i think the the, the behavior of past youth like I said, which is no different from PKR youth or AMNO youth or, or MIC youth or whatever, this is something that we've gone accustomed to for too long. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would be very happy to see, you know, uh, members of AMNO youth, PAS youth, PKR youth, you know, uh, you know, articulating policies in a clear, rational manner. And, and to deal, I mean, for heaven's sakes, let's deal with real issues, yeah, mm -hmm. real issues. Malaysia is facing the, the, the real threat of, mm -hmm. you know, loss of foreign investment, loss of competitiveness, mm -hmm. the brain drain, which is a major issue in Malaysia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and frankly, um, Elton John, in the terms of priorities of, of national <laughs> risks, yeah. you know, uh, I, I would place Elton John like maybe 1,000, you know, number 1,000, and how Hantu Bonching number 1,001. <laughs> you know, we have uh, uh, many, many other real things uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to consider. Uh, the Malaysian economy will not collapse because Elton John comes here to sing once, you know. Um, uh, I don't even like Elton John's music, you know, so, and, and I just find this ridiculous, you know. There's much chatter, at least among academic circles, about the pos potential of post-Islamist mm. uh, politics mm. uh, as, a, as one of the direct consequences of the Arab Spring. I personally think it's too early to say, but what's, what's your thought on how that term is being used? Uh, and it's real life effects. Uh, uh, well, you know, these terms, you know, Islamist, post Islamist, uh, these terms are all ideologically and politically loaded because they are being articulated in a, in a discourse which is not entirely academic. They might be articulated by academics, but the discourse is never entirely academic. And particularly post 9 11, anything to do with Islam is immediately political. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you talk about Muslim food, it's still political, you know, you, you, you talk about a kebab, it's still political, yeah, because Islam has come under the magnifying glass of, of the world's political and security community. So the term post-Islamism, I, 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 I have deep personal misgivings about the term because I think, one, it's an empty signifier, it can mean anything, and two, often when it's used, it's used, I think, by particularly um, you know, uh, uh, secular Western uh, ideologues who, who are really exercising wishful thinking. Uh, Post-Islamism means somehow uh, an Islamism that has exceeded or, or gone beyond um, you know, the, the concerns that I associate with Islamism, which is you know, social justice, equity, addressing issues of you know, power and state. Uh, now, what we, we are seeing in North Africa is, is basically a sort of a post-regime politics. And, 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 and whenever you have sedimented regimes that have been in power for too long, it, uh, an enormous vacuum is created. Now, like it or not, like it or not, in, in Egypt, in Tunisia, uh, the only semblance of an organized mass political movement, apart from the army, which is a state entity, but the only mass movement that is organized are the Islamists. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, um, Western Europe and Western European politicians or North American politicians may, may hope or, and dream that, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, uh, Egyptian Obama equivalent will come to power. But, you know, I mean, look at, the, look at the figures on the ground, yeah? The reality is that the Juan will directly or indirectly come to power and shape the future of Egyptian politics. We're already seeing that mm -hmm. yeah, in Parliament. We're already seeing that. Now, 
again, this, this goes back to my point earlier when we were talking about pass. It's always easy to be idealistic before you come to power. But when you come to power, you know, um, as much as you may, may condemn certain practices of the previous regime, you will find that, you know, countries today, no country is entirely independent in the range of political choices it can make. Mm -hmm. Because like it or not, the existing structures are already there. And there's also this superstructure of a, of a global economy. You cannot unplug yourself from that. Uh, Burma tried it in the 1960s with disastrous results. You know, countries that try to pull out of the Commonwealth or, or the UN, basically you, you fall by the wayside. And no country will attempt to become a North Korea now. You just can't. Mm -hmm. So this goes back, okay, since we, we, we were just talking about past, this also uh, applies to you know, the opposition in Malaysia. Uh, for, for the longest time, you know, all this uh, anti-Western rhetoric, uh, they were so popular among uh, certain sections mm -hmm. of the Islamist opposition in Malaysia. Well, what if you come to power tomorrow? Mm -hmm. yeah? What if you come to power tomorrow? Uh, for decades you've been you know, cursing and, 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 and you know, anything that has to do with America. Uh, if they were to come to our tomorrow, we still have an armed forces that has to be equipped. And when given the choice of buying weapons, which are a necessity for any sovereign country for its self-defense, uh, Malaysia, like many countries in Southeast Asia, have been shopping for armaments, modern armaments and upgrades, and one of the major vendors is the United States. Now, if you come to power on this ideological high horse of yours and say that everything American is evil, dirty, mm -hmm. kafir and all that, uh, are, we, are we going to uh, you know, uh, not buy uh, fighter planes or, or, or you know, uh, uh, other things? from buy, end up buying Russian ones, just to make a point. Uh, yes, but well, we've, tried to, we've yeah. tried to do that, but bottom line is this sure, anti-Western sure. rhetoric. Yeah. 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 I mean, we, we're not going to buy weapons from, from Yemen. Uh, uh, we're not going to buy weapons from, from Fiji. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Those structures yeah. will not be overcome overnight. And I think this is what we're going to see in Egypt. On the one hand, you have Islamists. And you see, they've been out of power for a long time. They've come into power now. They have to demonstrate that they are now in charge. But I think within a year or two, we're going to see that you know, they will have to adjust to the realities of, of, of global politics. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think uh, their challenge will, will emerge. Because in time, their own populations will see, look, you're still negotiating with the Americans, you're still negotiating with Europe. In fact, we, today I just read in the New York Times that they're, they're calling uh, for a unity government with the Hamas and Fatah. Yes. A new position. Yes. And that's politics. Yes. And that's politics. Yeah. And that's politics. And, and you can't escape that. You know? uh, I, I do not regard that as hypocrisy. Uh, I regard that as smart politics. Yeah. Um, uh, to, to commit yourself to a position where you know you start off by saying this is something we will never do. You and I, as non-politicians, can say that. Yeah. Uh, so I can say that I will never eat in you know this fast food joint for the rest of my life. You and I can say that. But as a political party coming to power, you you, you can never say never in politics. You know because in the end you might find yourself you know forced into a situation where you have to trade with a country that you hate uh, and yeah. that. Unfortunately, is is the reality that uh, of, of of the political world we live in. Okay. 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 Uh, can you can you define how you regard your responsibility as an intellectual? How would you characterize your, uh, your work? I, I, a I would I would not define myself as an intellectual because um, um, there, there are already too many people going around calling themselves intellectuals, and it, I find that profoundly irritating. I am a school teacher. Period. Oh. I am I, uh, whether it's in primary school or secondary school or college, polytechnic, university. Basically, we're all the same. We're school teachers, yeah? and I'm a school teacher. I'm very proud to be a school teacher. Um, and, and my role as a teacher is to engage with my audience, which would be my students, um, and to basically try to create the conditions of possibility whereby knowledge can be produced 
in a social context. Uh, and, and this is why for me, uh, you know, I, I've given talks in primary schools, uh, uh, colleges, polytechnics, whatever, you know, and the, the, the aim is the same. The role of the teacher is to, uh, the teacher cannot educate, I cannot educate someone, but I, with that person, together, can create knowledge. And I think my role is that. But teachers, in order to do this, require the basic requirements of you know, academic freedom. Primary requirement is the freedom to think, mm -hmm. the freedom to question. So, you know, since since uh, you know we are so proud uh, about uh, you know our universities and we have plenty in Malaysia, I think um, we should remind ourselves of what uh, the the Indian statesman and and, and philosopher and scholar uh, Radha Krishna once said. You know, the the, the you know, whole point of a university is that it, it gives birth to knowledge, but it can only give birth if it's free give birth to knowledge. You know. There's no point building universities with the latest high-tech equipment on the planet. You, know, you can have the, the latest laser technology and computer technology, but if you do not allow the basic fundamental right of a student to ask and think for himself, knowledge will never emerge. Because knowledge is not found in books. Books don't contain knowledge. It contains information. My lectures to my students do not contain knowledge. I pass information. But when we talk, discuss, criticize, question each other, knowledge production begins. Knowledge is a public thing, you know, it's a social thing. Mm -hmm. And that's what universities are for. And I, I, I'm, I'm very happy and proud to be part of that process because I really value knowledge. It's also part of our, you know, human and cultural capital. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, apart from, th that's why for me the loss of talent from Malaysia is, is a deep worry. And, and, and you know, and these politicians who say, well, you know, if you don't like it, leave, you know, they are actually committing a, a major error because that loss of talent, America's success, particularly in the 20th century, was its ability to absorb migrants, intellectuals, academics, and to, to create the conditions whereby the universities of America were the laboratories of thinking. And it is from these laboratories that occasionally you get some really stupid ideas, sure, sure. but occasionally you get things that are extraordinary, from from you know quantum physics to Facebook. That's why America leads the world. It still leads the world, and it's not just the guns and bayonets and bombers and tanks and aircraft carriers. It's the fact that you know it's still one part of the world where original thinking happens, and there's nothing special about Americans, despite you know what. All the, all the burgers they eat, they're just like us. We have, we breathe the same air, we have the same blood, biologically we're the same. So there's absolutely no reason why Malaysia cannot be mm -hmm. a center of knowledge production. All it takes is the political will to reform the way in which we run our universities. And that is why no matter what, no matter how frustrated I am with, with, with things in Malaysia, I still have faith. I've never given up with the Malaysian project because I still believe there is nothing uniquely wrong with us. Malaysia can succeed. I want Malaysia to succeed. I want Malaysia to be a center of knowledge production. Not because I'm some flag-waving patriot. I do not believe Malaysia is superior to any other country. I do not believe Malaysians are superior to other people. But like anyone else, we too can be the best that we can be. And I think this is what, you know, if we're going to if you have see changes in our country as a result of, you know, the political evolution of our society, let that be one of the changes, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I I enough propaganda, enough empty slogans, you know. This generation, I think, is, you know, immune to slogans, and I think that's a good thing, you know. Mm -hmm. But whether we rise to the challenge of having the guts to open up our universities and to allow this, and there's always that risk, you know, there's always that risk, but we have to be brave enough as a nation to face that risk that, you know, by opening up our universities, genius will emerge. Do we need a crisis to wake us up? Profound change usually requires uh, some kind of uh, moment of awakening. I think we, we have a crisis already, but it's a sort of different crisis. We don't have a crisis in terms of rioting in the streets or blood on the streets, thank God for that. But we have another crisis which Malaysians are not aware of. It's a crisis of a mass epidemic of sleepiness. Mm -hmm. And the whole country is on sleeping pills. You know, this is, this is our lot 
as Malaysians, regardless of your ethnicity or religion or language or what have you. This is our problem. We fell into a crisis that is a sort of sleeping pill crisis. We are a nation that's going to sleep and dreaming that it's awake. So we are in crisis and the challenge is to wake up. And the faster we wake up, the better. You know, Crisis doesn't have to be dramatic and the solution doesn't have to be dramatic either. Like I said, no, I'm too old now for drama. I'm really sick and tired of dramas. I don't want any dramatic politicians. You know, we can, you know, the, the, the great thing about the Malaysian situation is unlike so many other countries that have major structural problems, you know, I'm facing the, the real existential threat of invasion or natural disasters. We are lucky. We've never faced that. Even the confrontation with Indonesia was, was a limited, short affair. You know, we've never been faced with an existential threat. But you know, we, we have become, unfortunately, a comfortable people and we've allowed comfort to overcome our reason. And I think this is where you know, the time has come. You know, at one point, we as a nation have to grow up. And I hope that, you know, I, I hope that I live to see the day that this nation grows up, you know, to become a mature nation. Final question, where would you put yourself in the political spectrum? Left, right, centre? Uh, I, I, again, I think we are all complex uh, individuals. In, 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 my, in my student days, I, 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 I was more decisive. But today, decisive we, towards uh, decisive uh, left of center. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but as as I, I I I grow older, and it's partly because I think as a result of growing older, doesn't mean you just get old and tired like me. Yeah? But it just means you you encounter more and more and more options, which which forces you to engage with all, all all these options. And I think that basically, on some issues I'm right, on some issues I'm left. You know, um, when it comes to karaoke, I'm completely right wing. I really hate karaoke, which I think is just garbage and I think it just makes people stupid. Uh, when it comes to the responsibilities of the state, uh, I, I still believe that the state has a responsibility. So in that sense, I'm the all, all soft left you sure, know, sure. on these issues. When it comes to private morality, I, I'm a liberal. You know? No state should ever interfere in, in the private lives of, of its citizens because every citizen has the right to at least guard that space. You know? That is my social contract with the state. Mm -hmm. I will be a citizen, I will, I will fulfill my responsibilities and my duties to the state, but this is what I ask, you don't mm -hmm. get into my head. Mm -hmm. What I read, what I think, that's my business. Mm -hmm. So on, 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 on different issues, you know, I, I, I tend to veer in, in different ways. And, and that's why I was struck when I was reading the biography of Margaret Thatcher by John Campbell. Um, everyone assumed, especially you know, my generation, university days in England where we were demonstrating against Margaret Thatcher all the time and when we tended to demonize her you know as this complete you know if she was the most evil right to, of Genghis Khan you know uh, but when 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 I read the biography I was struck by the fact that even as a politician in England during voting on bills you know um, on certain issues Margaret Thatcher was still guided by her conscience for example when the bill came for the um, legalization of abortion for example she opted in favor of it uh, because she believed that you know this is a personal choice for people you know so on matters of orientation gender abortion she was actually quite liberal uh, and I, I think you know with with time I appreciate that I appreciate the fact that human beings are nuanced mm -hmm. and in a way that's good because I would be a bit worried if someone was entirely right wing or entirely left wing sure. um, so so that's the best sort of answer I can give you at this stage. Well, thank you, Faraj, for your time and for your uh, generous insights. Appreciate you uh, spending your Saturday evening with Islamic <laughs> Renaissance Front. Yes. Okay.